It's a privilege to introduce today's session. Now, the ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and we're also the organizers of the AI for Good Global Summit alongside XPRIZE Foundation in partnership with 37 UN organizations, ACM, and co-convened with Switzerland. And the goal of the summit is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale those solutions for global impact. And like much of the world, the AI summit has gone digital and we're moving forward with weekly programming, allowing us to reach more people than ever before. Now, one might say that the heart of the summit has always been organized around what we call the breakthrough tracks, where we aim to connect AI innovators with problem owners to identify and generate practical applications of AI and AI for good projects. And these past 10 days have been no exception. We've had teams working hard for 10 days, producing uh, groundbreaking AI for good projects and stay tuned for new project proposals today and some key announcements. And also as a reward for your hard work, we have a special surprise for you. Those of you that were at the physical summit in Geneva last year may have seen a groundbreaking mag magician uh, Germany's most popular magician actually called Simon Piero. He's called the iPad wizard and he's doing a special last minute show for us. And after day, today, he might be known as the, the Zoom wizard instead of the iPad wizard. So if you can stay to the end, you can relax and kick back and enjoy a special magic show that's been put together just for your benefit. Now, before I introduce today's moderator, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping issues. First of all, your microphone has been disabled, so please use the Q&A and chat function if you wish to communicate. It's the role and responsibility of the moderator to identify questions and ask these questions to the keynote and the panelists. And we're counting on you, the participants, to create a very interactive session. And speaking of being interactive, I have a first challenge for you. Can you please let us know where you're connecting from? Simply use the chat function and make sure you mark it chat to everyone and simply type in what city, what country, what organization you're coming from, or just say hello. Here, I'll go first. Geneva, Switzerland. And who do we have here? Los Angeles, Myanmar, Baghdad, Tunisia, Dubai, Chicago, London, Beltway DC, California. Wow, we truly have a global audience here, which is very fitting for what we're trying to do here today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's moderator. His name is Amir Bani Fatemi, and he's the Chief Innovation Officer of XPRIZE, and he's also the Chair of the Program Committee for the AI for Good Global Summit. Amir, welcome, good to see you again, and the show is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, uh, and welcome everyone to the last day of this 10 days breakthrough series of AI for Good Summit. Uh, we have been delighted to uh, to have all these programs in the past few days and we have been really blessed by all the keynotes all the breakthrough sessions that we have had the chance to share with you so today's a special day because we are going to be making a number of announcements based on this breakthrough but also talking about the future of ai for good you've heard about the AI for good future by some of our keynotes some of them will come back today to share a little bit of, and give you a glimpse of where we think uh, this whole committee can go together uh, and this is a special day and we we'll talk about the global impact of AI on, on humanity and society. We thought to have a closing keynote today, uh, not as a closing, but the starting keynote today for this closing day. Uh, we, uh, with our friends and, and, and mentor, Peter Diamandis, I'm going to be introducing to you to give us a special presentation and keynote on how the world of abundance can impact AI for good. Uh, so, Peter, uh, welcome uh, to, um, to, to, the, to the show today. Uh, Peter is uh, actually one of the uh, uh, best entrepreneurs that I've had the chance to meet. Peter is not only the founder and uh, executive chairman of, of XPRIZE Foundation, but also uh, the Singularity Foundation. He is an entrepreneur, has created more than 20 companies in the areas of longevity, space, and different ventures. And he's a best-selling author of a few books, uh, bold, abundance, and the future is faster than you think. Peter has been named by Fortune Magazine as one of the top 50 global leaders. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Amir. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you. And uh, thank you to the ITU. Thank you to XPRIZE for, uh, for hosting this um, today. So if I may, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. Absolutely, Peter. Welcome. Great, 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 great. So uh, 
first of all, I just wanted to say hello to everybody uh, globally around the world. It's uh, one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has done is it's made the world a lot smaller with instant transportation uh, in, the, in the way and fashion that we sort of imagined the future would be. Uh, but I expected to be teleporting, not necessarily Zooming. Um, so let me jump in and talk about a few different subjects. Uh, especially during this time when the world is being hit by uh, negative news around the pandemic, around social unrest, around political unrest, it's kind of difficult to put ourselves in the proper mindset. And I think one of the most extraordinary mindsets that we can have, one of the most extraordinary mindsets that we need to have is one that says there is no problem that can't be solved. And I, uh, it's something that I've focused on and honed. <clears throat> One of the things that I am always talking to entrepreneurs about, those that I invest in, those that I mentor, those that I support, is ultimately your mindset is the single most important thing that you have as an asset. It isn't your capital. It isn't your technology. It's your mindset. And I bet if you went to the best entrepreneurs on the planet, from a Larry Page, a Jeff Bezos, an Elon Musk, a Steve Jobs, whomever it was, you took away all their capital, all of their technology, and left them just with their mindset, the majority of them would regain the majority of what they lost because your mindset focuses what you do, the decisions you make, how you filter details, the enthusiasm, the passion with which you go after your objectives. And so ultimately the question is for each of us, what mindsets do we want to have? And a lot of people, myself included over the years, we happen into mindsets. We stumble into them. We don't actively say, this is the mindset I want to create and the mindset I'm going to go and pursue. And I think it's more important than ever that we do that. And so I spend a lot of my time focusing uh, with uh, communities that I mentor in, in Abundance 360 and such, talking about uh, six different mindsets. Uh, the first is an abundance mindset will be the focus mostly what I speak to uh, the notion that there is nothing truly scarce, that you can turn anything from scarcity to abundance with the application of technology. I'll come back to that. The second is an exponential mindset. The notion is our brains are wired in a linear fashion, but the world around us, the world that you're working on, helping to build, create, is moving exponentially. In other words, you know, 10 linear steps, you're 10 meters away, 10 uh, exponential steps, you're 1,000 meters away. Um, the next is a longevity mindset. And I focus a lot on this in the work that I do, the companies I build, the investments I make, that we're in a position where we're gonna be able to add 10, 20, 30 healthy years on a person's lifespan. And understanding and believing that is a fundamental step in getting there. Uh, then a, a purpose-driven mindset, what is your purpose in life? What do you wake up every morning with and say, I'm super psyched, I'm gonna excited to jump out of bed to go work on this. And within the canvas of that purpose-driven mindset, what I call your massively transformative purpose, um, what are the moonshots you're taking? Uh, you know, most of the world is trying to stay even uh, and not drift backwards. Some are trying to make a 10% increase. Uh, but rather than 10%, what if you had the mindset, no, I'm going 10x, I'm going to go 1,000%. Well, that's a moonshot mindset. And then finally, a gratitude mindset, which I think is one of the most important things we can have today uh, more than ever before, to be grateful for the things that we have and grateful for the purpose, the mission, capabilities, the tools we have to solve problems. So let me dive a little bit into the abundance mindset and begin with this notion. Uh, I fundamentally believe there is no problem we cannot solve. Um, and we, as humans, evolved in a very different world. And the 100 billion neurons in our brain, 100 trillion synaptic connections that make up everything we see, fear, hear, uh, hear feel, all of those uh, are, are evolved. Our brains evolved from you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, back when the world was local, linear, and scarce. Um, but today, my question is, what do you truly think is scarce? Because I think if you... Uh, objectively look at it, we have the ability to turn scarcity into abundance. And one of the primary forces 
that is going to enable us to do that is artificial intelligence. It is all of the exponential technologies riding on top of computation, but AI is for sure one of the principal areas. Uh, let, me, let me dive down and convince you, if you would, with examples. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, water, energy, healthcare, education, you know, knowledge, all of these things, um, I would posit that most all of these things have gone from scarcity to abundance, or at least the potential for abundance as a result of exponentials, right? So uh, the biggest change that we've seen in society has been, in fact, the, uh, the notion that um, uh, we are, uh, you know, communications are now massively abundant, that there are more of these devices in the world than there are human beings and you have access to communication tech that would have made the presidents of most countries jealous just 30 years ago, just 30 years ago within most of our lifetimes. And riding on top of these devices is uh, information abundance and potentially knowledge abundance. And so that, you know, the child with a cell phone in the middle of Detroit, the Bronx, or you know Dubai, or you know uh, Colombo, you know Sri Lanka, whatever it might be, that child has access to the same information, uh, the same knowledge, if you would, that Larry Page, the founder, uh, and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, had. It isn't that you know Larry and Sergey's access to Google searches is a little bit better or a lot better. It's the same, and so this massive democratization and demonetization uh, effort going on for communications and for knowledge is leveling the playing field. So let's tick those off. Now, one of the areas that XPRIZE has worked on, um, the very proud of the work that Amir and Anusha and the whole team have done is uh, solving and knocking down grand challenge after grand challenge. And you know, one of them, for example, is water. We talk about water wars and water scarcity. You know, we live on a, on, a, on a planet that is two thirds water. It's a blue green planet, um, but yet 97 point, uh, you know, 97 percent of the Earth's surface, 97 percent of the water on Earth is salt water. You know, two percent is is ice, and we fight over a half a percent in our river and our lakes. But one of the X prizes uh, we had, the Water Abundance X Prize, said, "Hold it, one second. There's plenty of water distributed globally in the atmosphere." There's quadrillions of liters of water in the atmosphere, and we have the potential to extract that water any place on the planet. And so just a mindset shift that says, oh, OK, I can understand how technology can go from water scarcity to water abundance using atmospheric or biospheric extraction technologies that level a playing field. Um, in food, you know, we're getting ready to launch a food X prize that is fundamentally going to look at rather than trying to grow more cows, chicken, tuna on the planet as the, as the level of <clears throat> people move out of poverty into middle class and desire higher levels of, of protein, instead of just trying to you know, shift more of our global ecosystem to livestock, why don't we learn how to grow food in a very different way where it's cellular agriculture, where the food we are able to grow is healthier, tastes better, is lower cost and is far more available um, than the food we currently uh, we currently get. Um, housing, you know, technologies around 3D printing of housing. Anyway, there's lots of different areas, but the two biggest areas that I am super excited to go from scarcity to abundance and where AI plays the biggest role that I can possibly imagine is in healthcare and education. Um, and you know, on the healthcare side, there's an old adage that I love which is you know, the, the woman or man who has their health has a thousand dreams. And the person who does not has but one. There's nothing, nothing more important than our health. Um, and you know, it's sad that you know, disease does not discriminate and neither should health and healthcare. And the problem is today we don't have healthcare, we have sick care. We have systems around the world that only take care of you after you're sick. And uh, we have the potential to completely transform true healthcare, um, which is 
going to be a function of a number of exponentials that are converging. It's going to be sensors, uh, consumables, wearables, um, as Daniel Kraft likes to joke, under wearables. Um, you know, I'm wearing my Apple Watch, I've got my Aura Ring, I've got a small RFID chip that someday will measure, you know, blood glucose or mRNA in my bloodstreams, whatever the case might be. I, you know, most of us know so little about our health. We maybe go to a doctor uh, once a year for an annual checkup, but that's not enough. Your ability to understand when anything is breaking down um, and then being able to fix it um, or, or cure it or make an intervention. So healthcare is going to become a continuous passive process where the sensors on my body, the networks, the AI sh software shell around me is ultimately going to become my, uh, my healthcare provider, you know, making me the CEO of my own health to make the decisions I want. And we're going to move, uh, you know, the interventions of healthcare from the doctor's office and from the hospital. By the way, the hospital is the most dangerous place to be. We're gonna move it from there uh, into your bedroom, into your office, onto your person, where you're continuously being monitored. And all of these things are being enabled by AI, right? AIs that are scanning your skin while you're in the shower, looking for any kind of cancers or moles that could be a melanoma or any kind of a carcinoma to AIs that are using brand new technologies that can scan your body, right? Uh, one of the companies I love is a woman uh, run by a woman named Dr. Uh, Mary Lou Jepson, who's the CEO of Open Water. And she's building technology using red laser light holography and, uh, and echo that can basically image your body um, with technology as good or better than MRIs, but a thousand times smaller and a thousand times cheaper. And the goal there is find any kind of a cancer at the very beginning. Uh, we're at the verge of, uh, of uh, liquid biopsies um, from companies like Grail and, and Freenome that will be able to find any kind of cancers at the beginning so that ultimately you're able to catch disease at stage zero, at stage one, where it is ultimately curable. And these technologies are democratizable, right? These are technologies which can be in a village in any country around the world, uh, especially as we hit on the next uh, of, the, um, of the abundance uh, uh, trajectories, which is communications. Um, you know, in 2017, we had about 3.8 billion people connected on the planet. Um, Pretty good, uh, but in the next five years, we have the potential to connect every single human on planet Earth. And of course, this community knows that, especially uh, in partnership with the ITU, as 5G begins to cover the planet like kudzu, and as we begin to launch uh, Starlink and Coupier and a bolt, multitude of other uh, satellite-based uh, platforms, we have the ability to provide you know, multi tens or hundreds of megabit connection speeds uh, to the Gobi Desert or the Himalayas, uh, let alone downtown cities around the planet. And, and providing that level of connectivity uh, enables uh, something that's extraordinary, which is the ability to truly revolutionize education. So today, educational systems around the world are still Baroque and Barocan. Uh, there's still the sage on the stage with, you know, frankly, half the kids are lost, half the kids are bored. Um, and it's time we change that. It's time that we make education, you know, passion driven, where the child is able to follow their investigations. It's, it's more like the young ladies illustrate primer um, from Neil Stevenson's work, right? It's the ultimately, it's the combination of AI sensors, augmented virtual reality that allows a child who wants to learn about ancient Greece rather than reading about in a textbook or watching a 2D video to immerse themselves in ancient Greece and have a conversation with some guy in a white toga on a slab of marble who comes over as an AI avatar and introduces themselves as Plato and says, hey, what are you up to? Let's go chat. Let me show you around you know, Athens. And you have an immersive experience that you remember because we remember emotional and physical experiences versus a line from a book. And so these are democratizing capabilities that will uplift education 
uh, globally around the world and provide an educational experience to the one versus you know the one, that individual child who learns at their language skill with the f- examples of their favorite sports star or movie star or culturally appropriate and moves them from where they are to where they need to go. So you solve education, <clears throat> you solve healthcare, you solve water, you solve food and housing. And we're heading towards a world which is truly the world that I, I work towards. It's the work that I do with the XPRIZE Foundation through this incredible team of, uh, of, of leaders that we that we built under Anusha, uh, work that we do at Singularity University, work that I do in Abundance 360. It's we can create a world of abundance. We can create a world that meets the needs of every man, woman, and child. Not a matter of if we can do it. It's a matter of when we will do it. And it is, you know, the principles and thoughts around AI for good that are this democratizing force that democratizes and pushes all of these things forward. So, you know, ultimately, one of the things that's critically important um, is the notion that, you know, uh, all of these tools, computation, quantum computing that's coming online, uh, AI, sensors, networks, 3D printing, synthetic biology, augmented virtual reality, all of these are tools. And they're tools that only get put to good use and only get um, effectively enabled when they're employed by a person who's got a purpose and a passion. And in particular, you know, what I would, what I uh, and Amir talk about is really communities of problem solvers. How do we enable communities to step up and say, this problem, I'm done with it. I refuse to let this go on. There is a solution and we're going to use these exponential tools to demonstrate and pilot that solution. And it comes down to the individual. It comes down to the small team that says, I don't care what the government's doing. I don't care what companies are doing. I'm going to focus on solving this problem. This is my massively transformative purpose. And this is my moonshot. And, you know, small groups can change the world. And as the old adage says, it's, it's the only, it's the only thing that often does. So um, ultimately, what are you going to focus on? What are you as an individual going to focus on solving? Who are you going to bring together to form a team of problem solvers? You know, as I like to talk about <clears throat> within XPRIZE and SU is, you know, the world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities. If you're an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is someone who finds a juicy problem and solves it. And I, you know, I'm, that's my, my massively transformative purpose is to inspire and guide entrepreneurs to create a hopeful, compelling, and abundant future for humanity. So that's what I love to do through XPRIZE and, and through Singularity is find entrepreneurs and support their missions, inspire them, guide them. Because ultimately, more entrepreneurs picking and choosing problems and solving them is what makes the world great. It's what solves and slays problem after problem. Um, I want to save a, a few minutes for uh, for Q and A, uh, and so let me uh, take a moment and, and close on, on one last subject. So, uh, you know, I'm so proud. It's hard to believe that the X Prize is 25 years old. About 15 years since the Ansari X Prize got won. Um, and the question is, where are we going? And I counsel all of the companies I invest in and everybody I talk to that if you're coming through COVID-19 um, unchanged as a business or as a business model, you've missed the point. Um, it's if you're just trying to do business as usual, then you know uh, you've missed a massive opportunity because uh, this pandemic is a chance for people to pivot to become more exponential, more agile. Uh, and one of the areas that XPRIZE is pivoting towards is uh, something we talk about called global visioneering. And here's a vision, we're not there yet, we're at the beginning of this, but you know, one of the challenges is that the human race is fundamentally, let me just change that, our minds, the human mind is fundamentally uh, unable to grasp true existential threats. We don't 
um, we can we can grasp a threat of a, a lion or a tiger or you know uh, being in an earthquake, something that's affecting us in that moment right now. But existential threats that um, even when there's true scientific data, uh, we have a hard time as a society grasping that. Right. Um, COVID-19 is a perfect example. These types of pandemics have been foretold, been warned against, but yet we do nothing. Um, there are many other existential threats. There are threats that either government or large industries or philanthropists are not properly taking on. One example is asteroid impacts, right? It's even a small asteroid impact on the planet's surface will make COVID-19 look like a sunny day in Santa Monica. You know, if any of you have seen the, the television so, show uh, Social or the, the documentaries came out, Social Dilemma, you know, is that an existential threat? Perhaps, many do believe it. I, I was very swayed by that. Um, obviously the environment and species extinction, all of these are, are existential threats. Um, you know, massive social unrest. Uh, so the question is, how do we deal with this if they're not being taken on head on? And so one of the things that XPRIZE is looking at is creating a uh, mechanism where every year a slew of experts from around the world help tee up a hundred uh, huge problems that are not being properly addressed um, either by anybody or not sufficient to move the, the program. So one of them, for example, forest fires. I live here in Southern California. This can be made a thing of the past. We've designed an X prize for wildfires that I think is an amazing X prize to put an end to these fires just popping up out of no place. Um, and anyway, put that aside. And so imagine a hundred uh, of these threats uh, that we every year curate, and then we narrow it down to the top 10. What are those threats that are the most important, that are the most prizable, um, and that are the most you know, near time term uh, urgent that we believe are solvable, and then create the designs around prizes for those top 10, uh, create the compelling data, and then going out to the world and asking the world, hey, here are 10 existential threats. First of all, you should know about them. You should educate about them. This is conversations with your politicians, conversations with your family at the dinner table. Um, and which is the most important that we should focus on this year? And then have the world vote. You know, have a hundred million people around the planet vote on what they consider their, the most important problem they want solved that year. And then launch that X prize two weeks later and then follow it and have a hundred million people, a couple hundred million people follow that competition as it attacks and solves that problem. And then the next year, wash, rinse, repeat right? In other words, do it once again and have this engine of raising them up the most important problems that the world needs to know about and at least knocking down one of them. And with the right, you know, budgets and philanthropy, you know, the challenge is there's so much more that could be done. And uh, I don't see uh, enough philanthropists. I don't see enough governments. I don't see enough companies actually solving those problems. Uh, I don't know what they plan to do with their money after they're dead, but I can tell you they can solve these problems. These are problems. There is no problem that cannot be solved. All right, I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, Amir, take it back to you. Peter, wonderful to um, have you give us this, not only positive, but uh, accelerated perspective. Because as we try to uh, understand what problems to be solved, you give us a framework, uh, one to shortcut, the problems and leapfrog to future where we can see ourselves being in better harmony and better life and also minimize the problems that are today that are still real. What I gather from your talk is that you're inviting all of us to be engineers of change, not just Love observing that. problems, but being an actor of this change and engineering that. You, you did notice that we are very focused on collaboration and cooperation and solving problems together. In We don't have time for questions, but are you able to tell us how should we look at AI for good or changing problems in the world through the lens of abundance? How should we have a mindset to penetrate these problems by thinking wide and large and having enough stamina and energy to go through the difficult times of solving those problems? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Amir. And 
listen, I want to give people a framework that I think about things. Um, can we create a world in which the needs of every man, woman, and child are being met? Not the extravagant needs of I want a Ferrari, but the needs where every child born today has access to the best available healthcare because it's completely digitized, demonetized, dematerialized, and democratized. I think the answer is yes, it's ultimately going to be AI and robotics and robotic costs can be, you know, can be demonetized significantly. You know, the best diagnosticians are going to be AIs. It's going to be malpractice soon to do a diagnosis without having an AI in the loop. And that is something which is completely demonetizable. Um, can every child have access to the best education um, that is important and relative to them and their culture? I think definitively yes. And again, that's over the global uh, communications network we're building and AI and other you know, imaging technologies, but we can get there. Um, can we put a roof over people's heads? Can we give them clean water? Can we provide food far cheaper, distributed? You know, half the food costs of the, of the meal you're gonna eat today is travel miles because you know, your different products come from a different world, but what if you can manufacture those locally in vertical farms or in cellular farms? These are things that can, can provide healthier local food that becomes, you know, again, demonetized. And, and for me, uh, you know, the lens of AI for good uh, is simply this. How do we provide every man, woman, and child the things that they need? Um, and people talk about the widening wealth gap. And there is a widening wealth gap. And I don't want to, you know, uh, but I want to give you a different frame for that. For most of all history, it was the pharaoh, the king and the queen, the emperor on the hilltop, and the rest of society, 99.999% in, in squalor, supporting the needs of those few at the very top. And that was, that was society for much of the planet. Um, and it was the few haves and the massive have nots. And the, we're moving as people move out of poverty. And I look at the charts every year, people moving out of abject poverty towards, uh, towards middle class, it gets better every year. And it's not because we've gotten smarter, have better politicians. It's a function of technology turning scarcity into abundance. But ultimately, our goal is to go from a few haves and the majority have nots to everybody being haves. And yes, there'll be some at the very top who are uh, super haves, and that's okay. But can we create a world where every mother knows that their children has access to their needs? And then is that world a better world? And I definitely think it is. I think it's going to be a more peaceful world. And I think that's the world, at least that within the X Prize and within the you know AI for good that we're striving towards. So um, I hope that is a, a useful lens. Uh, I think you know ultimately if we can meet if a mother knows that you know and I look at child mortality rates plummeting, um, you know having again over the last over the last decade as one of the most important measures, right? And if a mother knows that okay my child is going to have food, water, a roof healthcare, education, communications, access to entertainment, all of those things, maybe not too much entertainment uh, as my nine-year-olds are on their tablets way too much. But uh, you know, that's the world we should be aiming for and AI is the great enabler for that. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for these uh, last thoughts and uh, it gives us uh, a lot to work with and this lens that you brought into turning this mindset of fighting poverty into a mindset of seeing things through the lens of abundance. Thank you again. And I think this is a wonderful way for us to, to start uh, the announcement we're going to be making today and energize uh, the whole community. Well, thank, thank you, Mir. And thank you, Frederick. I'm grateful for the work you're both doing on this. And thank you for really driving this over the years. Okay. I'll, I'll go thank off you. camera now. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, as we hear, as we heard, uh, Peter, uh, I think the um, what Peter says comes from years of experience into uh, enabling entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is not just creating a startup and finding product or service; it's also taking charge of 
the problems that we have and being engineers of, of those problems and solve them together. As we have navigated through the past four years of AI for Good, we always heard the, uh, the notion that AI and data should be used for the public good. And the notion of public good is very relative, but as we understand that we want to give autonomy and agency to everyone, uh, a big part of these uh, capabilities comes from understanding how everyone can play the game of AI and how everyone can participate in making AI useful. One of the big drivers of machine learning, at least, not just all AI, machine learning is data. And last year, uh, at the close of last year's summit, we talked about this notion that AI and data should be used for the common good. And soon after we uh, launched an initiative uh, with the ITU uh, called the Global Initiative on AI and Data for the Common Good. And as one of the first outcome of this initiative uh, was a project called a Global Data Pledge. Global Data Pledge being a movement, being a campaign, being a framework for understanding how we can each contribute, whether personal or corporations, to be part of this donation of data that is needed and so much needed for uh, tackling big problems with machine learning. So I'd like to invite uh, Richard St. Pierre, which is the executive chairman and the, one of the founders of C2 International, but also the man who's took the, uh, the, the leadership and say, I'm in, I want to help get this movement started on global establish to invite Richard to talk more about updates on where we are and what is this journey of global data pledge. Richard. Thank you, Amir. Uh, thank you, my friend. And hello and thank you everyone for joining us from all around the world today. You heard uh, a few minutes ago, Peter Diamandis uh, telling us about mindset. I hope that the next uh, five minutes will encourage you to join us in our moonshot journey about data. This is a summit about AI for good and talk about anyone in the AI industry, and they will tell you that data is literally the blood that brings the oxygen to AI. But data is expensive, and more importantly in this case, mostly secret. Yeshua Benjo yesterday was outlining uh, this fact in a session that data remains locked in vaults of organizations of all, for all sorts of good reasons and valid reasons, intellectual property, trade secrets, and so on. But those organizations have no incentive today in sharing it. Not only that, sharing it takes a lot of effort. So why would they bother? And isn't this part of the problem? So what happens when a crisis hits? If data has the potential to save lives, is data a human right? Well, maybe not in all cases, but we know that having the right data at the right moment completely changes our understanding of a crisis. Whether it's a pandemic, a tsunami, an environmental disaster, you will agree with me that having the right data changes our ability to respond. Secrecy might have its place, but it certainly slows down our ability to respond to a crisis. If there's one thing that this pandemic that we live in now is teaching us is that we are all on the same boat. Viruses do not understand borders. The problem is that secrecy makes us respond in fragmented ways. When the dust settles on this pandemic, I think I'm convinced that we will arrive at the simple conclusion that we could have been better off if most of us were sharing what we've got. So in time of crisis, data can become one of the pillars of improvement of human condition, especially if we connect it to AI. So that's why today's announcement is our response to this problem. It's our moonshot, as Peter just said. So today is day one of the Global Data Pledge. So we aim to have organizations pledge their data. We're open to contribution from national government, institution, private organizations alike. We're not asking organization to open their books of data sets. We're not asking everyone, anyone to give away their private data either. We're asking organizations to pledge under certain conditions in a time of crisis that they will collaborate with other organizations and share that data. That's what we're asking for. 
So when a condition is triggered, a, a pandemic is a good example, organization that can use the data will be able to turn to organizations, organizations that pledge the data, connecting the two and avoiding the mismatch that we currently are seeing all around the world today. They will then figure out a way to collaborate and define the parameters of this collaboration. The data pledge removes the first barrier to sharing data. The first barrier is knowing that the data exists and that someone is willing to share it. We're not looking at replacing open data initiatives or uh, all around the world. Many exist and they're all great. What we're aiming for is to act as a catalyst for the exchange of that data to take place. Let's address the elephant in the room because ever since Amir and I started this global data pledge conversation a few months ago, numerous people got stopped in their track about privacy issues, storage consideration, uh, encryption standard, and the list goes on and on and on. These are all important questions that we can't avoid, and that's not the point. But they can be handled in due course. They are not barriers to explore the possibility of pledging data. Imagine if you were to de design your dream home and you started designing your dream home by looking at the plumbing code, the electrical code, and so on, you likely will end up with a very ugly house. Not to say that you'll be rapidly overwhelmed by rules. So the global data pledge is the design phase of that house. The building code needs to be handled, but accounted for at a later stage. So the announcement for today follows the effort that started a few months ago, phase one. We asked a group of 50 volunteers, and I take the opportunity of thanking them because they were from all around the world, from Mongolia to Canada to France to Argentina. Thank you for pledging your time over the past few weeks. So they worked on drafting a data pledge playbook design in parallel to working on a document on how we can collaborate and scale this project. So now we're in October, after a couple of months of tinkering with this, and we are prepared, we are preparing for the official start in January of the pledges itself. Of course, if you want to pledge something today as an organization or as an institution, you can do so. Please reach out. Don't wait for January. But the signing of documents and so on will start early in the year. So we have a few months ahead of us, which brings me to your role in all this. This is not just an announcement. At least that's what I'm not aiming for. It's a call to action, your action. So what can you do? Of course, if you can pledge as of today, raise your hand. You have my address there and we'll reach out to you. But don't wait, the time is now. If you're just interested by the topic, join our LinkedIn working group to be part of what comes next. It's open as of this morning. Very few people right now, but I can tell you within a couple of weeks, it's gonna be a few hundred, if not thousands of people joining the conversation. Lastly, while listening to this pledge presentation, I'm sure you had a few ideas, including who might be interested in, the, in pledging and so on. If there's one thing that you could do is reach out to either that organization that would be interested in a pledge, inform them of what you heard, and connect back with us. We want to hear from you. Drop me an email, whatever way you want to reach us, please do so because it is by working together that we'll, um, we'll, we'll uh, be able to make this a success. Before I turn it back to uh, Amir, let me share a, a personal thought in closing. When I look at everything that is happening in the world right now and how complexities are acting as barrier for doing the right thing, I know that if we work together, we can overcome those barriers, no doubt about that. This is not my project. It is our project because the world needs it. I hope that you will join us in this adventure. Amir, back to you. Thank you very much, Richard. It's, uh, it's great to have that update. So may I ask you a question? So if an organization wants to be part of the pledge, uh, are they actually sharing their data or just merely announcing that they're going to be sharing their data when the time is needed? The organizations 
pledge data. A pledge is not about a commitment to share. It's a commitment to share under certain conditions, the conditions that the organization decides they want to share it with. So if the organizations, whether it's a country, a company, and uh, uh, non-government uh, organization, they have data, they pledge under certain condition to participate and share it with a greater, for the greater good. And especially if it's aligned with the SDGs. So let's define afterwards, what word will those conditions be? But they decide, not us, the owner of the data will decide how and when it will be shared. Thank you, that's useful. Now, of course, uh... Everyone can participate to uh, write the book together, right? You're inviting everyone to join and to um, participate in designing the playbook of how data pledges can be done. And also, we work with all the international bodies and organizations that are working on standards, working on privacy rules, working on transparency and ethics. So, we're leveraging that work. We're just merely asking for a pledge of data. Uh, one question came out on, on the chat about uh, is this work connected with Japan G20 at the track about the big data society vision, which I know that is, is connected. Um, uh, how can we, uh, the questions to the audience is that how can we be more connected to this effort and how can we work better with, uh, with the G20 uh, task force that are working on data uh, connection and data pledges and this data pledge is under the banner of AI for Good and the SDGs. Um, uh, any uh, other thought, uh, Richard, uh, that we can think of in terms of joining forces? Uh, you mentioned the timing, so the goal is to uh, launch in January of 2021? Uh, that is the goal. Uh, that being said, that's a, only a date. That is, we want to act as of today. Um, of course, we will make further announcements early in the year, but let me, let me uh, do it, say in closing that the world right now, because of the virus, is kind of folding on itself. Countries are closing their borders because transportation is a problem. Migration of people is a problem. But the way to solve this is actually by opening up how communities connect together. So existing organization about data is also a call for us to help them and help them to help us. So we're not looking at replicating what's already been done, whether in Japan or in open data societies that exist around the world. There's thousands of them, and I applaud them. But we want to help as a catalyst in taking this to yet another step of collaboration with them. Thank you again, Richard, for, for joining us and give us an update on the Global Data Pledge. Um, uh, there is, you mentioned there is an email to reach you out and also there is a LinkedIn group if you want to join, correct? That's correct. The LinkedIn group is Global Data Pledge. Uh, you just type that into the LinkedIn search and you'll find us there, Amir and myself, as well as uh, my own emails to reach me directly, Richard St. Pierre, RST St. Pierre at globaldatapledge.org. Looking forward to the, the chat. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so now uh, we are going to be um, turning into the result of the past 10 days where we uh, introduced to you uh, three themes. The three themes this year were, uh, of course, gender equity, uh, the future of food and food revolution, but also this collective pandemic intelligence. So we'd like to start with food. And uh, to start with food, um, we, we have thought of uh, inviting back um, Caroline uh, Colta, who is uh, the prize design lead and expires on food and agriculture that has been helping all this breakthrough uh, go through beginning to the end and have worked with the Brent Trust uh, on food as well. And joined by her uh, is uh, Nigar uh, Mabutova, uh, who is uh, the executive vice president of growth uh, and innovation at Danone. Uh, she's an accomplished global CEO and 20 years of experience across many emerging countries and continents. And she's bringing uh, her experience of the past 20 years on, on food and distribution uh, and global impact uh, to, to the conversation. So Caroline, um, uh, we'll leave you in your uh, hands to, to guide us and to have this conversation with uh, Nikiar and to share with us uh, the outcome of this 10 days, but also where we are going and where we can go together. 
Thank you, Amir, and welcome, Nigar. I invite you to, to unmute yourself and, and share your, your video with us so we can have a conversation. Welcome. Um, so as Amir mentioned, we spent the last few days working on three tracks. One of them is food and agriculture. And I have the honor of, of having this conversation with Nigar to learn more about uh, how Danone sees this, this sector and what they're doing in that space and announce a collaboration with XPRIZE. So Nigar, I'd love to start with you on how you see food systems in relation to the, to the world and the SDGs, uh, first of all. Hi, Caroline, and uh, hi, Amir and everyone. And thank you for a very nice introduction. It's my pleasure and my honor to join you today and uh, share with you the views of Danone, but also I would like to start with my personal views. And with a bit of the personal disclaimer, I'm a foodie. I'm, co I am coming from the culture where food is central to the life. It's uh, part of the connection of the family. It's expression of the um, values of the, of the nation, of the country. I come from Azerbaijan. Um, it's expression of love. And the first thing you offer when people come to your house is the food. And it's unthinkable that someone will just leave your house without having a nice meal. So for me, the food is big, big part of the life and the culture. And the food system obviously is linking a lot of uh, different aspects of life. It's not only the nutritious food. It's not only food as a first medicine. It's also the whole sociological and economic link between the different um, uh, ecosystems of the life. So in a way, the food system becomes a nodal point of the linking these systems. And therefore, food has a, food systems have a very important role to play in advancing our technology and the, the way uh, of living and advancing on SDGs. The most obvious ones which we are thinking about and putting a lot of effort is uh, the zero hunger, the good health and the well-being and the clean water where Danone is playing a big role. But beyond, beyond as well, because especially with advancement of the technology and the AI, um, food systems are enabling a lot more people to participate in it and therefore is addressing the less obvious uh, SDGs such as a decent work and economic growth, uh, reduces in inequalities and I know that you are talking a lot about the gender equality. It's part of it. So that's the way we look at it in Danone and that's the way we structure the work which we are carrying on to ensure that um, we build resilient systems and we build the systems which are acting and uh, serving the needs of people as, uh, and, but also is not competing with, um, uh, with the world and with the nature. Yeah. And, and picking up on, on the resilience of the food system, of course, one of the things, the big themes of 2020 was, is the pandemic. And I, I'm curious on how your personal views and, and Danone's views on how the pandemic impacted food systems or how food systems impacted the pandemic? Because it's a two-way street with this one. So I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, I, I agree with Peter uh, when he said that if uh, you did not uh, really adapt and change your way you do the business, you've missed an opportunity. Because uh, there is always a breakthrough in every breakdown. And the current pandemic was the biggest breakdown in the history of uh, the last, I don't know, since the Second World War, probably, or maybe even bigger. And um, of course, it's a wake up call, because unfortunately, it's a type of the breakdown of our own making, of us being the users of the uh, ecosystem of the nature, and not being careful and not really managing the coexistence. Our actions led to the point that the habitat was destroyed. Our actions led to the fact that, uh, you know, we became um, exposed to the viruses, which were always there, but we were sort of coexisting and uh, protecting our own lives. So now it's, um, it's a reality. It's a reality and it uh, puts uh, a lot of pressure on rethink and um, redesign the way we are going after the uh, 
yields and production of the nutritious food, the way we are uh, talking about our brands and connecting with our consumers when it comes to building, uh, you know, the awareness of what is good is or what's um, what's good for uh, people. And um, in that sense, uh, definitely we are very um, confident that our frame of action in Danone, which we are formulating as One Planet, One Health, which essentially is rooted in strong belief that every time you make a choice of the food, you are making the choice for the world you want to live in, that is uh, now is more relevant than ever. And raising the awareness and raising the level of education is an important element and enabling the better mm -hmm. solution for people to be accessible, available, and affordable, which is also a very important element, is an important is a very big agenda for Danone. And that's why we are actually very proud to and very pleased to partner with AI for Good, with ITU and with XPRIZE having this conversation now. Absolutely. And and I wanted to pick up on you mentioned enabling. And I think Peter also in his speech mentioned AI as an enabler. So I am very curious to also hear about how Denon and you are thinking of innovation and AI applications for the food and agriculture sector. And if you can share some priority areas for these applications um, that you're yeah. thinking about. Uh, on a day one, my boss Emmanuel Faber joined us, and he talked uh, uh, and he talked about um, uh, two big um, collaborations with the startups. One being Bright Seed, and another one being on How Good, which is putting AI into the center of understanding of uh, how to yield the better crops and how to formulate and raise awareness about the better product. So these are the as the two examples. And there are numerous examples also in uh, cooking when it comes to the personalized nutrition, when it comes to um, uh, really driving the uh, nutritious and uh, food solutions for people which have a very special needs, when giving the babies the best start in life once uh, their mothers are either choosing or not capable of giving them the uh, breast milk. And... Uh, you know, all of this is enabled by the AI and by the uh, sometimes also with the machine learning coming out of the big data because the big data is also indeed helping to make the better um, solutions, design the better solutions. And uh, one thing which uh, um, is important to keep in mind that most of the technological advances and, you know, nuclear power is just one example, can be... They are, they are full of controversy. They can be devious and they can be, um, they can be used for good. And that's why I believe the initiatives like uh, you're driving as an XPRIZE and AI is um, important to make sure that the technologies do not enslave people and they are not used to really suppress the creativity and suppress the food systems, but they actually enable and become the force for good. And that's that's the way we, we view it within Danone as well. That is great. Thank you so much, Nigar. And I, I wish we have more time because this conversation is amazing. And I, I really love how you entered into it thinking of culture and what food means past the farm and distribution and consumption, past these concepts. It's really is fundamentally it's a linkage of economy, environment, and society. So with that, in the time we have left, I, I am very excited to have you share some of the collaboration work that we've been doing together, XPRIZE and, and Danone in the food sector. And if you can share with the audience some of what we're working on together and, and what we're hoping to achieve, um, that would be really uh, great for the audience. Thank you. Here. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, maybe I'll start by mentioning the three teams and the three projects which we are most excited about. And uh, the first one is uh, Grow Next and uh, Radiant Earth Foundation and Project Farm. And all three projects, um, are, first of all, they are embodying the type of innovation that we need to build the resilience of the food systems. They are perfectly on brief of uh, what uh, you were, we were asking for when we were asking the questions on uh, 
uh, how did you formulate the question? Uh, how might, how we might? And I was thinking that, okay, I, I challenge you. Shall we put also the question on how will we to make the language intentional? Because it's not only about the might, it's not only about dream. Of course, every start, everything starts with the dream, but it's also about taking actions and putting that into the real plans. And with this, I'm very excited to um, unveil the collaboration with XPRIZE that uh, we joined forces recently to develop and design a circular economy-based framework for a series of challenges to meet the SD SDGs. And uh, why the series of challenge? Because the food system is so diverse that one challenge, uh, addressing one challenge will not solve the, uh, uh, will not solve the future. And that's why we will work together on uh, developing the suite of challenges and inviting entrepreneurs uh, to participate and to, um, uh, to come up with ideas and to work on uh, solving and uh, the, the challenges and creating the solutions for the future. So uh, from the circular economy for food values framework, we'll, we will stand on three core principles. The future for the future of this food system, inclusive and equitable, nourishing and desirable, and uh, finally regenerative and resilient by design. This is what we are putting as a foundation of the principles for the XPRIZE, which we are happy to announce. And finally, to build on your point about uh, uh, collaboration, um, no company, no fund can uh, solve the challenge of the future food systems on its own. That's why we are uh, inviting everyone to join forces, not only on data sharing or not only on the pledge, but actually on actions, because we are not competitors here. We are the solution providers for the future. And uh, we are very happy to partner with XPRIZE and ITU, and we need to come together and we need to cherish diversity in all the uh, uh, in all aspects of life and uh, and the food system and um, yeah we invite uh, everyone to join us yeah thank you nigar I, I have to say i've on the express side i've been working on this values framework for a couple of months now and just to echo what you're saying we did realize when we first started exploring the circular food economy concept that one prize is not sufficient and because of the complexity of food systems, you really needed to think of all kind of stakeholders and, and environment, technolo like technology, um, the, the society and how social interactions happen with food. And of course, at the, at the end of it is, is the economy. How can we make this, as, as you mentioned, nourishing and desirable for consumers and producers, etc. So it's really, really exciting to have Danone's partnership in that work. Uh, we're very excited to do more um, there. <clears throat> and finally, like in the spirit of coming together, as you mentioned, um, this is both an announcement about our, our collaboration and also a call to action. I want to invite everyone listening to join us. Um, <clears throat> we have an online uh, community of experts where we in invite you all to join and register, share your thoughts about our uh, framework. We want to create a comprehensive framework that is very inclusive of all these different voices and expertise. So in the chat, um, we'll post a link to the online community and we, we really invite you to click and, and register so you can help us design this and be uh, partners with us in, in designing this comprehensive framework. So Nigar, if you have any, any last words, we're approaching our time, but I, I'd love to end with you if you have any final words to share. Uh, well, just to say, to echo your words of encouragement for everyone to join and also to say how honored and pleased we are as Danone to be partnering uh, with XPRIZE and uh, to drive forward this initiative. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much, Nigal. It's a pleasure to be having this conversation with you and an interaction. And, and with that, I will hand it back over to Amir to take us to the next announcement. Thank you again. Thank you again uh, very much, uh, Nigyar, to joining us and for uh, the words that you said, cherishing diversity is easy to say, not easy to do. 
So uh, we would love that. And uh, this is how we think uh, in this community and XPRIZE. And uh, I'm very hopeful that our collaboration with ITU over the past few years, where we managed to bring a number of uh, United Nations agencies, uh, including World Food Program, but many others too, uh, and UNICEF, but also uh, the, uh, the NGOs to join forces in this journey of future food and food revolution, which tackles not only the SDG uh, about, uh, about hunger, but also many other SDGs about health, gender equality, but also uh, education, many other that are basically connected to food. So again, thank you very much. We have had a number of breakthroughs in the past week that we uh, will we'll be uh, including in this journey and give them a voice and opportunity to move on with their projects. Thank you again very much. Uh, we talked about food and food revolution. Uh, we also had a conversation about uh, collective pandemic intelligence. And uh, uh, now I'm gonna turn over to uh, Andrew Tohert, who have been the, the facilitator of, of, of those uh, breakthrough sessions, but also my colleague and the VP of partnership uh, and strategy engagement at XPRIZE and have been really instrumental in bringing all this committee together to talk about how we can actually have common solutions to uh, not only to pandemic, but using AI for the common good and hear what he uh, has to share with us. Andrew. Thank you, Amir. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining and uh, good, to, good to have you back here again. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the findings and outcomes out of the pandemic track, but then also extend that further, how we're, how we're taking that forward. Um, first and foremost, you know, working in the collective pandemic intelligence breakthrough track, uh, I had the pleasure of working with a number of projects and teams uh, where we had brain trust experts on the teams and this community here, uh, all working together to explore, you know, three particular projects that where we could apply data and AI towards impactful solutions for COVID-19. Um, and as we went through that journey, um, th there was a number of issues, particularly first and foremost, revolving around data. And it's amazing how much the themes around data do align to everything you heard Richard say and align to what the Global Data Pledge is, is looking to address. Um, and those themes were really access to more data sets. Every project that we, we heard about has, in some cases, some seed data, but they need access to those data sets. And in particular, um, data sets that are really representing more um, those uh, you know, regional communities or underrepresented and overimpacted communities where a lot of those solutions we're developing are for, the, for their benefit. Uh, two is uh, new mechanisms for sharing of that data. There's, um, there's you know, the, the state of, of the art is either needs to be improved or needs to be many of the capabilities that are out there today need to be, need to be adopted in, in, in the, to a great extent. Three is there's all the ongoing concerns, of course, around the sharing of those data sets, be they even be identified data sets or data sets that contain some private information. And again, a lot of the concerns may be more policy than they are technical, um, much aligned to what Richard was talking about. And lastly, of course, that um, there are so many different disparate projects across these different domains but there was a common theme. I mean, we even saw different projects in, in pandemics, and I think we saw this in the other tracks too, where two projects with the, the output of one project can feed another. So there's definitely a need for people not only to say, have a, a, a bigger call out for the data that they need, but also just communicate with each other across these different projects because the output of one project could actually generate the data that the, could be the input of another, of another project. Um, and so, of course, we encouraged all, all of these and do encourage all those organizations and projects to connect on the, on the Global Data Pledge and, 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 of course, this community to help them in that regard. As it relates to AI, there is absolutely no doubt there's a significant number of applications that where we could apply particularly AI to COVID-19. A lot of them about empowering public, pu public policy, public health uh, to make better decisions. And of course, individuals to be better informed about their own about their own well-being, and and all these projects we worked all revolved around that that similar type of theme. Um, and again, like I said, I I believe we would see the same thing out of the future future of food and the gender equity tracks. Now, with that as a backdrop, um, I am joined here but today by uh, uh, Vikas Bhatia, the head of product for Azure Confidential Computing at Microsoft. Um, and as a, as a peer and colleague of ours, um, I'll ask him to share a few words um, really about how Microsoft or what Microsoft is doing, particularly helping a, com a global community of data scientists and solution developers like those around here or those in these project teams 
to address some of those um, challenges that we see as such common themes across all of these projects. So Vikas, would you mind speaking a little bit? Yep. Uh, thanks, Andrew and Express for the opportunity to speak at this event. This is so inspiring. Uh, thank you to all of you for participating, uh, given everything that's going on in our world. Seeing this happen is so heartwarming. Uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to join you today. So thank you. So here at Microsoft, we see similar challenges to the ones that you've outlined, right? In order to do good, data scientists need access to the data and that the data should be something that can be shared with each other for collaboration. But when we share this data, we need to make sure that we are confident that we prevent unauthorized access to both the data and the models themselves. We also need to make sure that we are complying with regulations and rules around sharing such personal and PII data. As was mentioned by Richard St. Pierre a few minutes back, uh, data remains locked inside organizations. What can we do? How can we enable organizations, researchers, governments, public agencies, private agencies, and so on to just share the data while maintaining confidentiality of the data? Now, as a tech industry, we do a good job of protecting data at rest when it is in storage, and we protect data in transit as it moves over the wire. However, today, when we operate on data, we operate on data entirely in the clear. What happens? Because we do this, we expose our data to bugs in the ecosystem and malicious actors, malicious human actors who can scrape the data as we are using it. Now, this becomes critically important and prohibitive in these data sharing scenarios for AI that we've been talking about. And we wanna make sure that even the operators who run these machines for us do not have access to the, the data as it is being operated upon. With Microsoft Azure Confidential Computing, we are ushering in the start of a new level of data protection, starting with our world-class researchers and working closely with the industry partners. We are developing new ways to protect data while it is in use thus protecting that confidentiality and integrity of your data. The data is only ever in the clear within the protected encrypted memory that when you're operating on the data. So what does this do? How does this help us? This capability can now help us enable multiple parties to share data with each other while maintaining the confidentiality of the data and the models. Thus, nobody has access to the data. Uh, whether that is the cloud operator, Azure, uh, the operating system that you're running on, Windows, Linux, so on, uh, or, or even the code, the, even the human operators, whether they are your own operators or our own Microsoft operators, will not have access to the data and the models. This is pretty groundbreaking. It, this is a game changer in how we think about data and sharing data. So we've been working with the community here. Uh, the work that we're doing with the Confidential Computing Consortium, where we're trying to bring the industry together to accelerate the adoption of confidential computing through open collaboration. Uh, we've donated our uh, platform enabling open enclave SDK to the consortium. Uh, we've also recently open sourced the work we did for confidential machine learning uh, using the Onyx runtime. What this lets us do is this restricts the machine learning hosting party from accessing both the inferencing request and the corresponding response. As you can imagine, this is pretty revolutionary in how we can now collaborate with each other with these data sharing scenarios. Microsoft is committed to contribute to the communities of innovators and solvers, such as those as we see here in AI for Good, Breakthrough Tracks, who are making the world a better place with data and AI. We look forward to connecting with those project teams after the summit on the AI for Good Slack channels. Uh, please get in touch with us and let's start this conversation for protecting, protecting data as we use it for good. Uh, Graham Bury from our team uh, is on the Slack channel, so please connect with us there. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, this is great. I mean, it's so, it's so, of course, what you're doing is such a key, can be one of the, the many solutions to the problem and a very important one, and your efforts around open sourcing it and uh, involving a community and helping, uh, help contributing back to these solvers is fantastic. So thank you once again for sharing those thoughts. We will schedule, there's a lot of depth to what you talked about there. We will um, look forward to a, a webinar where we uh, go into more detail about how 
this community could take advantage of some of those things that you're offering um, and uh, look look out to, to the community to uh, to see something get scheduled there. So thanks, thank you again. Yeah. So now now building on that, I mean, this is a great example of how we've been working across the ecosystem that AI for Good uh, uh, and XPRIZE has put together here um, about how we can basically help do solution development. And I also wanna highlight the um, what we've learned from our pandemic response, um, which is along these lines, which is really about the creation of an alliance. You know, the, the P XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance has taught us and our partners about how we can con convene a diverse set of, of like-minded parties um, to, in the context of a specific theme or cause, to generate uh, initiatives and projects and challenges, not once, but on a, on a regular basis. Um, the Pandemic Alliance alone has generated 17 projects, two competitions have launched, six more in development, all just within the short time that we formed that, um, you know, in the last few months. Um, and so, you know, as we, um, as we have the benefit of, of that, and then we also have the benefit of learnings from all of the different AI related projects that we've seen X, as XPRIZE over the last many years. The uh, Rainforest XPRIZE, very uh, dependent upon AI, our AI XPRIZE, of course, gender equity initiatives, which you'll hear about here shortly, our work on the data collaborative, XPRIZE data collaborative, have all been centered around AI in, in a competition format for the creation of solutions. We've got projects underway in development around AI uh, accelerated vaccine discovery, around continuous community health assessments, uh, working in partnership with different municipalities around the world. Um, so when we, when we combine these, these the, kind of these, the, these initiatives around AI, when we combine, when we look at the value we are able to create out of an alliance, we're, we're now looking to launch a new one. Um, we're therefore pleased to announce that XPRIZE will be applying this same methodology uh, to, uh, to the launch of a data and AI for good alliance um, coming here shortly in collaboration with a number of industry, industry leaders like Microsoft and Cognizant, Cognizant is another one of our, uh, of our partners. Um, it will launch later this year, as you can see on the screen there, um, and the, the intent is, uh, and we will have it be a, a coalition of the most forward thinking organizations and innovators, focusing on enabling and cultivating actionable and tangible solutions to some of the world's most immediate challenges through the use of data sciences, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and a, a humanity for our sustainable future. Um, we are right now. We've uh, we're inviting our community around us uh, here on this call, our extended uh, AI and data-related community, to join us to participate. You'll see there's a, a link on that slide there, xprize.org/ai-alliance. We welcome you to uh, to visit that, get a little more information of what's coming, um, and also it's your chance to express your interest to be part of this initiative. There's a sign up that you can you can fill up on this form. So I think this is such great timing for it, both the, in the case of the summit as it relates to the solutions we've been developing over the last many weeks and last many years. So we really look forward to working with uh, with a, a community here around the launch of this alliance. Uh, welcome you to sign up and join and, and please reach out to us. So with that, uh, Amir, I think I'll hand it back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, uh, this announcement comes uh, as uh, as one additional framework in addition to the AI for Good Summit that we have been working on four years between uh, XPRIZE and ITU. And uh, we hope to basically identify very early on problems that we can have an impact on. Uh, talking about problems that we have an impact on, the third breakthrough was on gender. And uh, we have been working for the past two years under Anusha's leadership on the topic of gender equity and how we can actually put an end to this uh, misunderstanding on gender and, and the whole conversation about gender data gap. Those conversations have led to gender initiative that we started, but also through the breakthroughs we have demonstrated also and viewed that many are coming together to, to find ways to address that. So it's my, my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Anusha Ansari, our CEO, to talk about uh, what we have done in during the breakthroughs, but also to, uh, alongside with her, three of our keynote speakers that joined us last week, and give us inspiring talks uh, to join her and to uh, to lead us to uh, what we think is an important announcement that will sit in the alliance, but also uh, for a good summit, and also for all of us. Without further ado, Anushe, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Amir, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, and thank you for powering through 10 days of intense conversation with us. 
Um, I'm really excited to be here and to ask, um, inform you about the initi initiative and ask for you to help and join. I know you've been hearing that a lot. Uh, what we want to do is offer you all the opportunities and and allow you to join the ones that speaks to your heart and is of interest to you and you're passionate about. One of my passions is, um, you know, addressing the issue of gender bias in the world. And it has been something that it has impacted me personally uh, through my life. And uh, I want to make sure that as uh, our children, our young um, daughters grow in the and become engineers, scientists, uh, artists, uh, and politicians, hopefully, in the world that um, they have an easier time doing so. Um, I am focused on gender bias, but in general, equity is at the heart of what I believe in and, and, and believe that we can do better in the world. So um, you've heard from many um, of our speakers, especially the ones on the gender track, how uh, important it is for us to focus our attention on uh, having data sets that are diverse, that include data that uh, represents the real world out there. And uh, the real world out there, 50% of it is uh, made of women. And uh, we wanted to uh, have conversations around how uh, AI can uh, be used in solving these problems. But at the core of it, as you've heard in many different aspects, data is what feeds our algorithm. And if the data is not good, then we have a big problem. Uh, as I was listening to, um, to the conversation uh, at our opening keynote where Carolina Criado Perez talked about the gender data gap uh, and all the examples she has in her book. Um, and someone asked her, how can we solve this? And uh, it has been something that we started an initiative at X Prize to try to figure it out. And it is a very difficult, complex problem. Um, so as we were searching for solutions, uh, we um, were inspired by something that was done earlier on in the AI world called ImageNet, uh, a, an initiative that was um, started by Fei Fei Li. And uh, in, that, at, uh, in that time when this started, it was a unprecedented, um, you know, very unique approach to solving the problem of data. But fundamentally, she believed the same, that if we don't have a very good um, set of data, a set of clean data that's tagged, that's properly um, uh, collected, that people can use, then uh, AI advancement will not happen in time and it will not represent the real world. So um, we're trying to do the same thing for, to solve the gender data gap issue. And uh, the initiative that we want to announce and uh, hopefully launch uh, with your support uh, later is the GenderNet. Uh, as I said, it's inspired by ImageNet. And our goal is to create the most comprehensive um, uh, data set that is um, ethically sourced, that is um, diverse, that is not biased, and make that available um, so people can develop their algorithm um, using this data. So there's no excuse anymore. Don't want to take the excuse out. And also um, use it to identify uh, perhaps areas that bias may exist. A lot of times we see that people are not even aware of the biases. So creating tools that can detect bias and also providing the data that can help eliminate these biases. Um, data 2X has identified um, six main areas where data gap exists. Um, those areas were economic opportunities, health, education, human security, environment, and uh, public participation. And uh, we hope that we can help um, identify and through collaboration source those data we heard from Microsoft. We can keep it safe and secure and allow for collaboration. And I'm sure with all of you and the companies you work with or your own knowledge, we can build something that's comprehensive, that is secure, that is safe, ethical, and it can be made available to the world so we can solve this problem once and for all. 
So I'm really, really happy and excited to announce, I believe, this historical project that we can all start together. And uh, with that, I want to invite three superheroes, uh, people who, when I listened to, I was so inspired. I was on cloud nine and uh, welcome them back to share some thoughts regarding this initiative. Um, so I would like to have um, Carolina Criado Perez, the best-selling author of Invisible Woman, um, Rian Eisler, um, a social system scientist, um, and uh, Francesca Rossi, the IBM AI ethical global leader to join us. Thank you. Um, should I start talking? Or? Yes, <laughs> Caroline, please. Sorry, I wasn't sure what the next, um, yeah. the next thing was. Okay, so I'm going to start talking now. Um, that was a great introduction to me. Um, my, my book, Invisible Women, um, as those of you who heard my uh, talk earlier on will know, is about the gender data gap, um, its causes and its consequences. The causes are very simple. The gender data gap is basically a result of a widespread bias that has been around for millennia that has led us to think that collecting data just on men is good enough. And this means that the vast majority of information we've collected globally and continue to collect, everything from economic data to urban planning data to medical data has been collected on men. And this means that pretty much everything in the world from the office you work in to the transport you use to get there, both public and private, to the medical treatment you receive, to the phone in your hand, to the apps on that phone, have been designed to work for men, with the result that most things in the world don't work that well for women. So this is a problem across all sectors, as I have mentioned, some more serious than others. It's more of a problem, for example, if your doctor can't diagnose your heart attack than if you're too cold in your office. So I think we can agree that all of those are, sub, uh, are suboptimal. Um, but it's become particularly urgent to address the gender data gap recently because of this increasing incorporation of AI into our lives on a daily basis. Um, so AI that has been designed using only half of the world's data has resulted in, for example, voice recognition software that doesn't recognize women's voices, HR AI that won't hire women, uh, perhaps most concerningly, I think, medical diagnostic AI that is likely not going to be able to diagnose women's medical problems. And the reason I say likely is because we're not quite there yet. Uh, we're still at the research stage mostly, and I'm basing that on papers that I've read, um, which certainly don't look good because in this most crucial of sex sectors, we are still not using sex disaggregated or even sex balanced data. We are designing medical diagnostic AI in areas um, where we know there are sex differences, for example, in heart disease um, and how heart disease progresses in women versus men. Um, and we're designing these uh, diagnostic AI without accounting for those sex differences. So this matters anyway, but it's a particular problem as in it matters anyway for, for medical research, heart diagnostic research, but it's a particular problem in AI because of course AI doesn't just reflect our biases back at us, it amplifies them and by a significant amount. So those of you at my talk earlier um, in the conference may remember the study I referred to, the 2017 images study, uh, which, which trained an algorithm on this very commonly used image data set, which had pictures of cooking uh, being 33%, over 33% actually, more likely to involve women than men. The algorithms trained on this data set connected pictures of kitchens with women 68% of the time, which is quite a dramatic increase. And the paper also found that the higher the original bias, the stronger the amplification effect. So you can see where, why this matters so much, why it's so concerning. Um, and what we have is a problem when it comes to AI in that increasingly the technological capability is there, but the data simply hasn't kept up. And this has the potential to lead us to a really, really dangerous place, um, which is why I'm so absolutely delighted that Anisha and her team have stepped up here with this amazing initiative, um, which has just been announced. Um, it really is absolutely vital um, having sex disaggregated data, having sex balanced data to ensuring that instead of creating a world in which we've literally coded inequality in, that AI can instead deliver us the better world that I know we all want. So thank you very much, Anusha. This is such an exciting, um, this is such an exciting time. And I'm, I'm just really delighted to be able to be here and, and be here at, at its birth.
Uh, thank you, Caroline. You have inspired us at Express with, with your words and uh, continue to do so. So you'll be a big part of it. Thank you. Uh, Rian, may I uh, then ask you to uh, share some thoughts with us? Your, your mic is muted. Oh, I'm not talking to myself anymore. I, I too am very excited about this initiative. And I look at it from a systems perspective because really by basically devaluing, marginalizing, and yes, often ignoring no less than half of humanity, uh, what we're doing is crazy, right? I mean, it does not represent reality. But this said, it does represent a reality that we need to change, which is that not only our algorithms, not only uh, our data, our studies, like, for example, the medical studies, which, I mean, only a few decades ago did we start really looking in terms of heart attack, you know, they kill, right? And finding out that actually these signs of a heart attack are not the same in women and in men. But because all the studies had been done on men, who knew, right? I mean, women knew because they were dying, right? Uh, so this, this can be a matter of life and death. But I want to get back to the second part of reality. The reality is that we have all grown up uh, with what we're taught in universities as important knowledge and truths. I mean, I woke up one day uh, that realized that in all my years of so-called higher education, there had been hardly anything by, about, or for people like me, women, girls. And that was wow. So this is a moment of awakening. And I think what you're doing is such an important tool. And I want to really take it even further because the devaluation of women, of the so-called feminine and, and, and these rigid gender stereotypes, which are gonna be a, an issue for you, okay? Because they're there. I mean, we're trying to leave them behind because, you know, men have been told that being a real man in what I call a domination system uh, is not being like a woman. Well, what happens with the male preference, with the data focusing on only half of the species, really, of one form of the species, is that uh, we have also devalued caring, caregiving, nonviolence, because they've been associated with women and the feminine. So, so caring and sensitive men, they're called sissies, even by women who have internalized, because this is not a matter of women against men or men against women. It's a matter of the kind of social system that we have. So I really congratulate you on this. I know you're gonna have challenges because the gender stereotypes are so uh, powerful, even though we're trying to leave them behind. And I would suggest, that as you do this, a first step is to unpack them and to really understand that a lot of what has been called feminine is human. And a lot of what has been called masculine, not domination and violence. I mean, that those are dominator traits, not male traits, but uh, logic so-called, you know, men are supposed to be more logical or, uh, you know, assertiveness, which is great in men, but devalued in women, right? So uh, you have challenges here. And I'm with you, though, 100%. And any way that I can be of assistance, I, I want to be, because our world, uh, AI is a integral to the future. And these algorithms uh, and the culture. So I see changing the algorithms as a two-way process. We change the algorithms at the same time that we change the culture, and the two interact. So bless you and go for it. 
And there's one more thing I want to say, however, since I still have a minute. I think that it would be very interesting to use, at least for part of what you do, the conceptual frame that I have proposed, which goes beyond right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, because none of these, I mean, they've been repressive, regressive regimes in all of these categories, but not only that, they basically marginalize or ignore the majority of humanity, women and children. So I've introduced a new conceptual framework, the partnership domination social scale. And that might be a helpful tool. And I want to clarify, by partnership, I do not mean just working together. Yes, partnership systems are more conducive to collaboration because we're not you know, just so tense and, and frightened and all the rest that goes with top-down rankings of domination, but uh, it is a configuration. And it is a configuration in which not only in the state, but in the family, there are these rigid rankings in domination systems, but more equality in partnership systems. And yes, gender and how gender is conceptualized so that both halves of humanity can be fully human can realize all of our potentials and that one is not ranked over the other, including so-called masculine values of domination and conquest over so-called feminine ones like caring, caregiving, and violence. That uh, is essential. So go for it. Have a wonderful time and bless you. Thank you, Rian. Um, thank you for your uh, leadership and I'm sure you will keep an eye on us, make sure that uh, we are starting this off on the right foot and with the right framework so we don't create uh, unintended consequences from it. But uh, appreciate your thoughts and all of your uh, wisdom that you've shared with us in this forum. Um, Francesca, on to you. It's great to have you. Yes, thanks, Anushesh. So this is really a great initiative as much and much, much needed. Um, as you said, you know, ImageNet really was a breakthrough for AI research uh, because there was no real benchmark where everybody was comparing uh, the accuracy, for example, of, of an AI model that was built uh, on interpreting images. But uh, over time, we realized that we needed more than that for in many dimensions, and and the gender dimension is definitely one of them. But even even in other dimensions, for example, recently um, IBM and MIT put together an an alternative uh, um, uh, an alternative uh, um, sets of images of objects. Uh, which are all in odd situations, in odd uh, uh, pictures from an odd angle, and and uh, and researchers have tried, you know, to test the same algorithms that they were testing on ImageNet with so much success in accuracy, also in this new um, in this new data set, and they saw a dramatic, uh, you know, uh, decrease in the accuracy. So that shows that yes, ImageNet was a breakthrough, but we need to move forward. And and address all the various issues that we found. And of course, the gender uh, equity and the gender bias in these data sets is, is very important. And having a gen, and of course, we know that machine learning models can inherit and amplify uh, bias, not just from the training data, but also from every other decision that is made during the development pipeline. So as you said, Anusha, I hope that this project can uh, start with the defining and making it available new data sets, which are gender uh, bias, you know, uh, which are not gender bias, but also it, it has a lot, it must have a lot of collateral awareness and educational initiatives around uh, every other pl place where bias can actually be injected into an AI system. So if we have all this in place, of course, uh, we can 
first of all, make the development much faster uh, in, in terms of development of AI systems that do not have these biases. Um, because, of course, we need the data set that can be used not just for testing once somebody develops an AI model, but also for training it. We need to use, to use it in both ways and not just as afterwards after the product has been built then you test uh, and maybe you discover that you were doing it in a, in a gender bias way uh, so much faster development and test for ai researchers and developers uh, it's also important that uh, uh, probably it will be i think not just one data set but possibly several of them and the reason is that there are many different notions of fairness and of bias that may be more or less appropriate in also related to gender that may be more or less appropriate in different scenarios so we may want to have either one big data set that has different visions different portions different views uh, that one can use for training and testing um, so or different ones for different definition of gender fairness in different application domains. And I hope that, uh, uh, again, this can be shared, but in general, again, together with uh, algorithms to detect and mitigate gender bias in AI models, uh, it can be an overall, uh, like a toolkit that can be open source where everybody can contribute and then can be shared. Uh, so for example, recently, at IBM Research, we did one called AI Fairness 360, which is not focused on gender fairness, it's focused on fairness in general, which has been donated to the Linux Foundation. So maybe a similar path where you know uh, developers can uh, contribute uh, in a very collaborative way to pieces of this toolkit, and then uh, the Linux Foundation or any other entity can, um, can own it and make it available available to everybody. Um, so overall, I think it's, a, it's a, an, a, you know, an incredible initiative. I think that many will jump on board um, to make sure that really uh, um, we, we can rely on data sets, benchmarks that can allow us to build models that, are, that do not have gender bias. Of course, one has to remember that bias, uh, one would like to avoid bias in terms of gender, but also in many other dimensions, right? So there is an issue of intersectionality and possibly the intersectionality can uh, uh, prevent us from completely eliminating bias in each one of these dimensions. So what is also important is to is that allow to be transparent about the kind of bias that still remain in the AI system if there is no way with the current technology to eliminate it. So transparency, um, um, transparency uh, uh, instruments are also very important. As, uh, and uh, to follow up on what uh, Rian and uh, I think Caroline also alluded a little bit that if we are, uh, um, um, if, you, if we can actually achieve our objective here, then the technology will not only not amplify our gender bias, but also help us, human being, be more aware of our bias. So we'll, the technology itself will help us uh, recognize that we are biased because we do we are we are biased we just we are not aware um and that will help us will alert us so when we may have behaviors that are not aligned to our gender bias or any other kind of bias uh, guidelines so i uh, which i think that's the ultimate goal of the technology you know we are not here to improve the technology because we like to improve the technology we are here to improve the, well yes we do have fun improving the technology but we are here to improve the technology so that by doing that we can improve ourselves and so that's i think is the ultimate goal of this uh, initiative absolutely thank you francesca um it is a, a big undertaking as i said it's something uh, today is just an invitation to join us to actually frame this in a way that will be comprehensive, that will address all the issues that we've been talking about over the past several days. And, and it is going to be a very big undertaking that cannot be done by one entity uh, or, or uh, 
even a couple of entities. It does, uh, it does require a very large um, cooperation across the globe with industries, with uh, scientists, with governments, um, and to make sure that we create a comprehensive, transparent, um, and balanced uh, set of data that can to make our future a better, more diverse, and inclusive future for everyone. Um, as I said, gender is the first uh, area of uh, work that we're starting, but as image that inspired many other .NETs um, that came after it, hopefully this will um, inspire many more initiatives around uh, other biases and making sure that we address those as well. And um, with that, uh, I invite all of you, I thank you all for joining and, and thank you, um, Carolyn, Rianne, and Francesca for your uh, wonderful words of encouragement. And um, I invite everyone listening to um, send us your information if you want to be part of this and help us shape it, form it, and launch it and uh, complete it. Um, and um, GenderNet uh, is something that uh, is at its infancy and uh, we are asking for your support to shape it and we can then launch it together. Um, so this is the email address you can reach us at and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and uh, how you can help. With that, thank you and I give it back to Amir. Thank you very much, uh, Anusha. Uh, that was uh, really inspiring and encouraging. Uh, I always want to hear uh, Caroline, Ariane, and Francesca, it's, uh, it's always, uh, we'd like to do more than we, so that's the problem. <laughs> we don't have enough things to do, but we have to do more before. Uh, so we're coming to uh, the um, the end of the announcement. We have done a few of the uh, about uh, an update on the Global Data Pledge. Uh, we talked about the effort that Express has launched on the future of food and food revolution, where are not only joining forces and with ITU and the UN system, we're gonna invite many more to apply AI for the future of food. Uh, we talked about all the breakthroughs that came for the pandemic alliance and the AI applications and the invitation of joining the AI and data alliance that we initiated all together globally as part of that. And finally, the, the gender net initiative, which we believe uh, if done properly with all of your help and uh, with, uh, with some good governance could be the transformative uh, framework of access to data that is the benchmark for good data that can help us all from training thing to deploying solutions. So over the past 10 days, we have uh, had the pleasure and the opportunity and the, and the luck to share with you your common work and then learn from it and, and share back to all of you. And as AI for Good Now is first old, we thought that this is a time to observe and to see where we are. Uh, and, and chart uh, the way forward. We heard from uh, Francesca herself, Yasha Benjio, Stuart Russell, uh, also Sasha Yucheni, where AI for good needs to be and where it could be. And the fact that AI should be part of a common good and a public good seems to be the common thread. But to make this happen, uh, initiative that we announced today could be part of the solution, but all your, as Peter said, all your active participation and having the mindset and the, uh, the energy to, to find one single problem and work on it could be making the huge difference. As we have the community of discovery together and we're working together towards those challenges, I think this community has uh, put a starting point that this initiative that we launched today are gonna be uh, our next chapters. With that, I would like to invite for the closing statements uh, before we have some interesting programs that uh, Fred would be announcing um, with, uh, uh, but I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, invite uh, Reinhardt uh, Scholl uh, has been my uh, my alter ego in this journey to 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 do more of the work, and Anusha to uh, give us some uh, closing statement about this year's breakthrough days and the general state, and probably some observations for uh, for our common path. Reinhardt, if you want to start. Um, thank you very much, um, Amir. I'd like to thank you personally. I mean, you have been on, on this journey from the very beginning. I would like to thank your colleagues at XPRIZE. I'd like to thank my colleagues at ITU. I'd like to thank uh, you know, all the uh, people who participated during the 10 uh, last uh, days, the breakthrough days, uh, the people that comprise the brain trust, uh, the experts uh, and, and the viewers. I think it was uh, a quality 
program and uh, quality production. And I hope that our uh, viewers uh, felt the same and the people who participated actively. Let me uh, maybe start with the uh, gender net initiative. So Anusha, I'd like to congratulate you to that initiative. What I really like it, well, one thing I really like about it is it's so easy. I can understand it. I can say it in one sentence. Uh, it's creating a database which is not gender biased and which is uh, ethically generated. It's so easy, but it's complicated to do. And uh, I think the easiness of explanation will be very helpful in getting uh, getting people on on board. And I have been a big uh, you know, fan of uh, Invisible Women. I think I was one of the early readers. I read a, a book review in The Economist. I bought it immediately. I read it, and uh, I've been turned into an evangelist for invisible women, so much so that colleagues ask me whether I have a contract with a publishing company, which I don't, and just think it's a great book, and uh, it's uh, it's fantastic. So ITU would be you know very happy to uh, to join that and to work with you on that. We can offer you know, a few things. Um, one is uh, we. Uh, can offer a network, we can offer technical expertise, and you know, we could also perhaps you know, offer secretariat support. We have in, uh, in ITU created uh, what we call an equals initiative. So like the word equal with an S, equals initiative. So we founded that together with four orga other organizations in 2017. And uh, you know, the, the goal is to understand the uh, digital gender divide and uh, what can be done against it. And uh, so that's a multi-stakeholder platform. We have uh, taught over 50,000 uh, women and girls uh, the digital skills. We have about 150 projects, uh, research projects uh, that are being run uh, throughout the world. And uh, we have also, we're also a, a leader in what we call the Girls in ICT Day. So that's one special day in April of each year where we collaborate with uh, governments, with NGOs, with industries, with uh, schools to convince girls that a career in the STEM field in sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics is a very exciting and a very rewarding uh, career path. And, uh, you know, we have just teamed up with TikTok and the girls in ICT hashtag in a very short time got over 30 million uh, views. Yeah, so we're <laughs> very, very happy about that. We're also in uh, planning to offer a certificate uh, that we can hand out to uh, girls, uh, women uh, between 16 and uh, 25 years that have done a, uh, a course on, on digital technologies. We also have a, a women network uh, that is a support group. So I think we can bring a network and technical expertise uh, you know, to, uh, to that. And we're very happy to, uh, to work with you on that. Also, congratulations on the um, AI and Data for Good uh, Alliance. Yeah, we'll be happy and I think uh, many other organizations also to uh, see how this develops and, and work with you on that. Uh, the uh, AI for Good Global Summit, you know, used to be a, a physical event and uh, this year we have really turned it into a complete uh, digital uh, platform. And when I look at the, well, basically it turned into a Netflix uh, of uh, AI for good. And if I look at just this week's programming, I mean, I was, I was amazed uh, when I saw how much we actually offer. We offer about 25 hours of programming this week. So there are the three breakthrough days with about three hours of programming. Then we also have today, tomorrow, and on Friday, we have our focus group on AI for health. That's an initi initiative that came out of the uh, AI for Good uh, Global Summit two years ago. And that's a joint initiative with the World Health Organization where we are developing a benchmarking framework to test the quality of AI models. So if an AI application tells you that you have cancer, well, can you trust that? And uh, to answer this question, that's what this, uh, this work is all about. 
Then uh, today we also launched uh, in another uh, show in the series of artificial intelligence. No, no, not artificial, uh, artistic intelligence, artistic intelligence, where we feature artists that use uh, machine learning and to push the, the boundaries of creativity. On Monday, we had a, uh, a talk in our session or in our stream, um, uh, machine learning in the 5G networks. I had a professor talk about uh, the next generation of wireless and uh, how AI will be able to help uh, to uh, bring this uh, bring this forward. So uh, we have a you know a lot of uh, programming on, on offer, but all of that is with the goal to identify AI applications, real tangible AI applica applications that can help. Uh, uh, move us forward to reach the sustainable uh, development goals. So I think these 10 breakthrough days are very good examples uh, how to get projects uh, come out of the, uh, you know, the summit. And uh, again, your congratulations to, uh, to all of you for, for the excellent, for the great work that you've done. Thank you, Reinhardt. Um, let me also echo my appreciation for four years of collaboration with ITU, with you, Chesup, and Frederick um, as our main um, interface. And it has been wonderful to see how this community has grown over the past four years and how uh, we have been encouraged by the participation and and the ideas and the initiatives that come out of uh, this uh, gathering every year. Um, we, I, I miss being in Geneva and being in person at the conference. So I look forward to, to uh, you know, seeing everyone again in person. But I think this was a rare opportunity to really get participation uh, from everywhere and people who otherwise may not have been able to travel to Geneva. But uh, nevertheless, we, we will get together and, and hopefully um, you know, continue reporting on, uh, on how we did on some of the initiatives that uh, came out of this year's gathering. Uh, it, this was put together by a lot of effort uh, from a lot of people on both sides uh, and it was made possible by all the sponsors. So I'm grateful for everyone who made it possible. It was six months of real hard work and we were able to uh, bring some of the best thought leaders and uh, speakers from around the globe. So I really thank them all for being part of this journey with us and inspiring us, uh, uh, planting new ideas, seeds in, in our mind and, and helping us um, to push forward the agenda of um, using technology in general, but in this particular case, artificial intelligence, which will be a driving force of change in the future and find ways to make sure that um, we use it for good. Um, in human history, we've seen many times where um, things got out of hand and uh, when we didn't think through how to use the technology, it, it uh, ended up hurting a lot of people destroying lives and communities. So we want to be smart about it this time. We've learned from the past and we want to do it well. And I believe the work we're doing together here, um, it's uh, instrumental in making sure that happens. Um, at XPRIZE, we, uh, we are all about making positive change in the world. And uh, it's a big uh, undertaking that's only possible through collaboration and this is what this uh, gathering is all about. Uh, I am personally super excited about our GenderNet um, initiative, uh, but again, as you uh, said as well, it's, uh, it's easy to talk about it and easy to explain it, but actually making it happen, uh, it's a huge undertaking. And uh, I don't say that lightly, uh, we like audacious things at XPRIZE. Uh, we ask our teams to do audacious things. Um, so I'm now challenging the world and everyone here to um, you know, join us on this audacious journey. Uh, with that, again, thank you for being part of this uh, uh, past 10 days with us. I hope you really benefited from uh, the conversations and, and you were inspired. And I hope to learn about how this has changed you and some of the work you're doing in the next uh, next year when we hopefully get back together with that um, and yeah
pass the baton back to you. Thank you so much, both Anusha and Reinhardt, for uh, those words. And uh, uh, extend our thanks to Chesab as well, who uh, was not able to join us. So as we conclude this breakthrough days, uh, we're hopeful that, uh, as, as Marina pointed out, uh, we're not just creating a Netflix of AI for good, but we give you as many inspiration for all these moments, as Peter said, to, to adopt a problem and help support it and work on it. And uh, definitely gonna be all those breakthrough uh, tracks and projects that we saw in the past uh, 10 days and uh, getting support uh, and um, forward. So we're looking forward to to upcoming weeks and months and uh, a bigger global gathering, uh, maybe in 2021. Uh, I'd like to invite Frederick again uh, to, um, to drive us to the next uh, stage and as we conclude this event to give us some inspirational and uh, interesting discoveries. Fred, Fred, before you start, I forgot to mention one event this week, that's our innovation factory, which will take place tomorrow. So that's another flower in our digital bouquet of flowers of our service offerings that we have. And uh, so that's a, a pitching win for AI startups and we feature the uh, Estonia AI startup system uh, next week. So that's completes this week's of offerings that we have. Okay. Excellent, yes. And uh, maybe adding to that, one of the panelists is uh, Jan Talland, uh, founder of Skype and one of the major names in the tech community. So I highly recommend tuning into that tomorrow at four o'clock. So thank you, Amir, uh, for the excellent job you've done uh, moderating over these past 10 days. I'd like to thank Ms. Ansari as well, and also Peter for his very inspiring keynote. Reinhard, thank you as well. And um, Basically, this is the end of the breakthrough days, but I like to think that it's also the beginning of many new partnerships and collaborations. And I hope that each of you walk away with a, a host of new ideas and maybe even a re renewed sense of purpose. And I think um, you probably can't get involved with everything, but uh, hopefully you can get involved with at least one or more of these projects. And um, we'll be providing all the links and email addresses, how to get involved in the chat, and there'll be a lot of follow-ups as well. Um, but before we say goodbye, we have one last surprise for you. If you weren't here at the beginning, uh, we basically arranged a, a last minute special purpose built magician, well, presentation from a magician. His name is Simon Piero. Mm. If, uh, if you were at the summit in Geneva last year, he did an amazing show and he's known as the iPad wizard and he's one of the most uh, popular magicians from Germany. And um, like the summit, uh, I think he also had to reinvent himself. Uh, we had to reinvent ourselves on how to go digital and you know, have weekly sessions and the breakthrough days. How, how do we put all of this online? And he had to reinvent his whole magic show and basically create a virtual magic show just for us. And this is the first time it's ever been presented just for our audience. It's not being live streamed or anything. So it's just for you. Um, but before I introduce him, um, we're going to need a few volunteers. So at a normal magic show, the spotlight would just pick someone up and you know you have the deer in the headlights look and you get pulled on stage and you know tough luck. Um, but this is a little different in Zoom. So we need a few volunteers who just, you know, we're not gonna cut you in half or have you pull a rabbit out of a hat. We just need you to answer a few questions to prove that what he's doing is actually real magic and it's not stage. And it can't be someone from ITU or x -Fire. So if you like magic and you're not too shy, please put your name in the chat and basically say that you volunteer to be asked a few questions at one point during the show. Uh, 